And um, as we get going, um, I'm going to put a link in the chat for an evaluation. I always forget, but we're supposed to have each of our programs evaluated. So I'll put that in the chat. And if you would do that before you leave the meeting, I would appreciate it. And was there anything else I had to remember, Maria? Um, where would you put the link of, for the presentation that I am talking so everybody can have the PowerPoint and use it later? So that's a fantastic question. I'm glad you asked me. And let's see if I can share my screen. Um, so my website is Catskill Regional Teacher Center. Uh, tiny URL backslash Catskill Regional Teacher Center. I'm going to share that with you here. Uh, or you can do sites, Google, and Catskill Regional Teacher Center. You can also Google search it now. For a long time, but we weren't high enough on the algorithm, but I think we are now. And if you go across the top there, there's presentations. And when you click that, uh, we will be putting, oh, the link is actually here. We've already put the link in. Um, and so you can click on that, and that will get you the presentation itself. And then I will also send you, when we're done with the entire thing, a little certificate, and we will send you a link into the presentation within that certificate as well. So without further ado, I think I will introduce Dr. Martoya. You can take it away. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm glad that you made it. It is very early and cold in January. And I'm feeling better, but I, I spend my New Year Eve and after Christmas with COVID. And I guess everyone will be head now with COVID at some point. But I'm better. I'm feeling better for you today. So um, I can share screen, Aaron. Oh, let me make sure that you I think, yeah, I think I can uh, now. So let me share it. OK, everyone is looking at my screen. Right, and I have the participants on the side. Um, what I cannot see is the chat, Aaron. So if you can uh, keep track of the chat in, in any case that anyone would have a question or a comment while um, the presentation. So um, I would like to do this, uh, before I introduce myself, I would like to do this a little bit interactive, a conversation through my talk. I don't want just to go through talking and talking, but whenever you have an idea, something comes to your mind, if you can just click the um, the question, the raise hand question, or put it in the chat. And, and then if Aaron, if you can be checking that and interrupt me at any point to, to talk uh, to the participants and, um, and have this more as a, as a conversation. So um, my name is Maria Cristina Montoya and I am a professor at SUNY Onionta. I teach Spanish um, for the last 21 years. I love Onionta, I love my job. And um, I initially started as a Spanish teacher, uh, but I really um, was in the field of English language uh, learning. I, I started, teaching a class and that's how I got into this. Uh, so my expertise in the field are a result of my experience and who I am and the work I do um, and that I have been engaged for this last uh, 21 years. Uh, this series, the first presentation that I'm going to, to do for you today is a series of five presentations where we'll have one each month. And this is aligned with an extended bilingual education certification that SUNY Onionta will restart. We had it for five years and now we are going through another process of um, grant writing for the state. And we will restart it hopefully this summer. It is a um, five courses that you take with two exams and then you become certified in bilingual education. Um, this is a grant funded uh, program with SUNY Onionta. So your tuition will be paid if you apply for the program and you go through it. And the intention that we have to that we have with this five series is that each series 
will be um, in relation to one of the courses that are part of this program. So the presentation today is um, related to the one course that is second language acquisition. And it's an introduction of the study of languages, how people learn languages, how kids uh, learn languages, and in particular, uh, in the context of English language learners in K through 12. So any questions so far? <clears throat> no, any comment? Fine, okay. So uh, let me uh, tell you a little bit about myself. So this is a slide about who I am, uh, where did I grow up? Um, you can see here a picture of myself when I was five years old. Um, so I usually do this with my students um, in, in this class when we introduce our language, our practice, how is that we became who we are today, a teacher and why in that particular field. So as I was telling you at the beginning, I didn't intend to be an English language learner or, or a practitioner, uh, but I became one because of my immigrant experience. My mother migrated to the United States in the 70s and um, she left me in Colombia. I'm originally from Colombia. And then when I was 11 years old, this picture over here, um, she to the United States and I became a English language learner in middle school. <clears throat> I started in last grade in elementary school, sixth grade. And then I went through seventh grade and eighth grade. When I was in eighth grade, I couldn't handle it anymore. It was very hard to be an immigrant child. And I had the opportunity to go back to my country and finish my studies there and live with my father. So that was very traumatic. And that's what a lot of ELLs uh, experience when they move into a new country. Um, there are some ELLs that are immigrants and there are other ELLs that are born in the United States of immigrant parents. I am the immigrant child. So this, is, this was my first experience into this field. Um, later on, I came back to the United States. I did my graduate studies. I learned English as a second language as an adult already. I was 23 when I came back. And that was a little bit different. Um, I was not in the K through 12 system. So um, I was an adult learner um, and trying to immerse myself into the productive system of the United States. When I became the Spanish teacher that I am today is when finally, uh, there was a need uh, to teach heritage Spanish speakers. They were not exactly um, learning English because they had gone through the K through 12 system already and learned English, but they were now at the college trying to improve their Spanish. And there it was when I first encountered this population and I was able to observe the population outside of my own experience. And then I was able to connect my experience when I was 11 years old with uh, the experience of my students. So these are some of my students. I have two type of students at SUNY Onionta. I have the second language, Spanish second language learners who are the students that want to teach Spanish in high school, or they want to become bilingual uh, teachers in elementary school. And I also have the heritage speakers. I have some of them that want to improve Spanish and use their bilingualism to become also teachers in the K through 12 um, system. I, I am part of the Oneonta community and there is a small Hispanic community. Um, it's little by little is, is increasing and you may find some people and um, in some students that come and go through the K through 12 system in Oneonta. So um, in Oneonta, I also do traveling with my students. I take my students to Columbia. And, um, and this is something that I really enjoy trying to be a bridge between my two cultures. Um, the first uh, time when I arrived into the United States was New Jersey. And then I ended up in New York because of my work in um, Oneonta. Um, so I would like to, to hear a little bit from you and um, from the participants, whoever wants to participate and you can turn on your microphone and, um, and tell me where you're from and what kind of 
um, experience you have with ELLs, why you're interested in, in this field. So if we can hear a little bit about everyone so I know who I'm talking to. Sure, I think uh, what I'll do is I'll call on people and that way I can ask questions if I have some. Uh, Anna Quigley, can we get you to start? I'm sorry, I missed that, what was that? If you can um, tell me a little bit about yourself, where are you from and what school district, what grade do you teach? Sure. Uh, and Mm -hmm. how you became interested in ELL. So what is your interest in learning about ELLs? So I'm actually certified in ELL. Um, I was recently certified, I want to say three years ago. Um, I was interested, honestly, because Riverhead, I'm sorry, I have kids crying in the background. <laughs> um, Riverhead has a very high need. Um, a lot of uh, ENL students have come into the district and we didn't have enough ENL teachers. So I was a special ed teacher who got an extension um, and I'm better able to service my students because of that. Um, and I keep taking classes and courses like this to keep up with my certification and keep on top of things. Okay, thank you. And Christina Davis, or Christine Davis, sorry. <laughs> Hi, my name is Christine Davis. Um, I work at South Court Wright Central School. Um, I'm currently a seven through 12 math teacher and I'm pursuing my administration degree right now. Um, we have no ELL students um, at our school. Um, I do have a little bit of experience. I did a, I'm gonna say probably 10 years ago, there was a migrant program at Hartwick over the summer. Um, so I worked that for probably about a month and a half-ish and that was a great experience. Um, I was teaching math, I had a translator. Um, it was just a very um, interesting and definitely something that I'm glad that I was able to experience. Thank you, Erin. Hi everyone, um, I'm Erin. I am a high school math teacher at Margaretville Central School. Um, and we have a large population of um, ELL students, so I'm just uh, here to gain a little more knowledge on how to teach them. Welcome. I have a J that. Yeah, you, you said it right. Hi, I'm Jessica. I'm a sixth grade special education teacher on Long Island. Um, and I have a work in a very diverse school district here. Um, and I'm taking this course just for my state uh, CTLE hours, how a percentage of that has to be an L requirement. So that's why I'm here to see any information I can take away and implement in my class. So, hi everyone. Hi, uh, and welcome, and Julie. Hi, I'm Julie Schell. Um, I teach fifth grade at Valley View Elementary. That's here in Oneonta. Um, I teach specifically the reading and social studies and my uh, colleague, Miss Melanie Goss, who's also here tonight, um, she teaches the math and science. Um, I, I'm not gonna try to speak for you, Melanie, but we're both here because Melanie has a new fifth grade student who speaks mostly, if not all Spanish. So we're trying to grab any kind of knowledge out there in um, helping her be successful in our classrooms. Welcome, thank you. And uh, Marie, uh, Marianne, I mean, Marianne Schwartz. Hi, I'm Marianne Schwartz. I teach second grade in Pat Chuck Medford School District, uh, which is a very diverse district. 50% uh, of our students are Spanish speaking. Um, I'm currently going for my certification in, um, uh, oh my goodness, just blanked out for a second. <laughs> my TESOL certification, and I'm just looking for some extra support in getting my certification. So that's why I'm taking this course. Oh, welcome. And Maureen. Hi, Maureen Daly. I work as a teacher's assistant for East Williston School District. I've worked in the high school, middle school, and now currently in the elementary school. And I'm taking this course to figure out how to better support my students who are ELL learners. 
Fantastic. Welcome. Thank you. Melanie Gross. Hi, I'm Melanie Goss. I teach fifth grade at Valley View with Julie Shelf um, here in Oneonta. And like Julie said, we got a new student this year um, who is primarily Spanish speaking. She has a little bit of English, but it's mostly greetings and, um, and things like that. So we're here just trying to learn whatever we can to meet her where she's at and help her learn um, English while still getting the fifth grade level content. Thank you and welcome. Uh, Michelle? Hi everyone, um, I'm Michelle Batista. I'm a reading specialist at the East Williston School District. Hi Maureen. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to kind of give myself more of a tools to help my students with their reading. We do have a growing population of L's. So I do have students that have both reading difficulties and RLs. So thank you. Thank you and welcome, Sandra. Hi, I'm Sandra Moxley. I'm an LTA at Valley View Elementary here in Oneonta. And I guess I'm on here to both um, learn and help any students that I work with um, and also for the CTLE. Thank you. And Shannon? Hi, my name is Shannon. I'm a health teacher in the Patrick Manford School District. I'm split between buildings. Um, most of my students are Spanish speaking um, ENL students. So I'm taking this course to just better support them. And also, it is part of our district CTLE hour requirement. So I figured, why not? All right, thank you, welcome. And uh, Suzu, did I say that right? Shushu? Shushu, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm sorry I cannot open my video because I'm cooking. <laughs> uh, so my name is Shushu, I am the new faculty in SUNY Onyanta. Uh, so I'm very happy to see like every teachers here and Maria uh, to introduce this section. Um, I'm super excited. Thank you. And I think that's everybody. Did I miss okay. anybody? There we go. I think we got everybody. Okay. So finishing with Shushu. So let me uh, wrap up on this introduction about our program. So I'm going to start first with um, introduction to the history, the theory, the practices uh, in second language acquisition. And then uh, in February, my other colleague will uh, do a presentation on comparative linguistic systems of ELLs. Um, in March, my colleague uh, Suryati Avas will talk about translinguing. Uh, which is a, a presentation about the diversity of the cultural and the linguistic backgrounds and how they interact together. And then um, Shue Shue will be working in April with uh, assessment tools. And finally, um, one of our colleagues in the K through 12 system uh, will be working with best practices uh, with ELLs in May. So that is our five series. And let me start um, with uh, a little bit about the history. I'm gonna talk in general about the history and, and the theories behind language acquisition. So this is basically a, a new field. It is, uh, it only started um, in the 20th century, at the beginning of the 20th century, before that, um, everything that had to do with languages, uh, had uh, it was more in the study of dialectology, the different dialects that existed, and the scholars at that point were doing more atlas, like word languages atlas about um, what languages are spoken and what dialects were spoken in different parts of the world. And at that point, the ideologies around language were about the perfect language. So what is to speak the perfect language? And there's, there was this idea, uh, this prescriptive idea of 
uh, someone um, being educated to speak the perfect language, which is something that was revaluated later in the 20th century uh, when we began with modern linguistics. Uh, Sassur, Sapir Worf, will, um, that connected the culture to language. And then Chomsky finally in the 1950s that introduced uh, the concept of cognitive linguistics. Uh, and universal grammar. So after the 50s is when we're interested in because is when we really took in consideration the speaker and the realities of the speaker and the socioeconomic and the sociocultural um, uh, dimensions of the speaker to be able to understand where they come from and how do they learn. Um, so the theories um, that interests us right now for um, teaching the English language learners come uh, from the cognitive linguistics, the universal grammar that states that all languages have something in common and at some point, uh, and everyone is, is uh, capable of learning any language under normal conditions. Um, and that, uh, we all have a device in our brains that make us capable of learning any language. Um, there was the behaviorism um, theory um, at the beginning that this was a psychological theory mostly, uh, but in the, in the field of languages, um, it was the practice that um, was taught by imitation, by reinforcement, a lot of audiolingual making the student listen and repeat memorizing. And this was how the study of languages uh, begun. And it was basically uh, done in the 50s. Um, <clears throat> however, later on, um, the monitor language theory and the input hypothesis crashing became very popular. Um, say, establishing a distinction between acquisition, acquisition and learning. So the difference is when we learn when we are conscious, when we monitor what we're learning, and the acquisition happens when we are unconscious, when it's subconscious, when we um, just immerse ourselves into um, different environments where we have to use the language and we have to communicate. And um, they made this distinction because the classroom, whatever we do in the classroom in terms of learning languages is artificial. In, in the classroom, we teach in languages, but not necessarily the rehearsal and the practice is something that happens in real communication for regular second language learners, like if, when I teach Spanish in the classroom. But for English language learners, this situation changes because there are in the United States, they are immersed in another uh, social context. They, are they need to communicate and all their learning are happening at the same time that they're acquiring the language. They are immigrants or they're children of immigrants and their target is to be able to communicate in that language. Um, <clears throat> We know, and uh, by the ELL, so you know that there is great anxiety, and the anxiety is not only because of the learning experience, but because of the social experience, the conditions that they are experiencing while they are in this new place, in this new school, in this new um, uh, country. So <clears throat> here I have a parallel um description of what is constructivism, which is um, a practice that in a theory that you use in uh, different uh, fields of education, uh, where you allow the students to create with uh, knowledge um, is, is the active versus the passive learning is not so much um, listening to the teacher, but more constructing knowledge and constructing meaning with um, whatever is given, whatever tools are given to the student. Um, so uh, going back to Krashen, Krashen talks about acquisition as an unconscious process. 
and he mentions the one, the plus one input hypothesis, where um, you have to meet the student and have to uh, ask questions and and teach the student at some point with the language that they understand, so you don't go beyond their um, proficiency at that moment, but you give a little bit more to the student, plus one, so they are challenged at the same time. And uh, Krashen also introduced the ideas of the effective filters, which will limit learning if they're not, um, if the teacher is not aware of how to make the students um, work with this effective filters that will impede their learning. Um, Chomsky um, talks about the existence of this universal grammar. So every student can transfer whatever knowledge they have from their previous language into the English language that they're learning. Um, sometimes there are explicit explanations that need to happen for the student to become aware and activate the learning. And sometimes those explanations are not necessary. Those translations are not necessary because of context, the student immersion will, um, will learn and will negotiate meaning and therefore acquire the language. Um, <clears throat> so one important concept that Chomsky brought for us was the idea of competence versus performance. This is something that happens in language learning. So competence is the knowledge, is what the student learns and is aware, is totally conscious of um, what he learns. So when, when you teach a student vocabulary, when you teach verbs, how to conjugate, how to structure sentences, there is the student learning consciously and that knowledge that the student um, obtains is, it's, is the competence. Performance, on the other hand, is what the student is able to do with what they know. So we know even as native speakers that we may know a lot about our language grammatically, uh, we may know all this um, syntax, but when we're talking in real communication, in real situations, we may not use it. We may uh, speak with errors. Uh, there may be filters there that are um, making us forget things or not use the correct grammar. So that's performance. So one thing is what the student knows and what the student is able to do with what they know. And this difference was brought by Chomsky. Um, later on, after the 50s, the cognitive theory um, was referring to, there is some rote learning that happens in the classrooms, flashcards, memorization, but this road learning needs to be um, associated with some meaning and that meaning in context. And so meaningful uh, learning needs to happen in order for the student to remember um, and to be able to use what they're, um, what they're learning in the classroom um, as, as knowledge, as information. So both types of learning are important. This practice, this, this memorization is important, but always this memorization needs to be with uh, some kind of um, social context in, in order to sink in. Um, in the applications of the second language, there is the interaction hypothesis where um, language teachers always imply that there has to be some kind of conversation, dialogue, negotiation, modify interaction. So when you talk to the student, it's not that you're doing baby talk to the student, but that you are modifying your language uh, in order for the student to understand and to negotiate meaning, meaning with you. Um, there has to be corrected feedback and the feedback, uh, there are different types of feedback. And in this course, we talk about um, recasting. We talk about how um, sometimes um, you give feedback to a student in a, in a way of dialogue, repeating what he said or she said in, a, in the correct way. 
and and highlighting it, maybe um, changing the tone of your voice, um, making important, making the connection between what you talk and what you write and what you ask the student to write. So it's making all those connections that you may provide corrected feedback without telling the student you're wrong, but uh, this is the way we should use this particular structure, this particular vocabulary. Um, so, and then later on the sociocultural perspective uh, is where we are basically today, how we need to teach the students according to um, <clears throat> the social aspect, the social realities that are around them. Um, and, and here is where um, the rural, the urban settings, um, all this comes into play. Um, the student needs to have comprehensible input and output. Um, they, uh, they cannot be pressured to produce whatever they don't know how to produce. So is a scat folding, which you know as teachers, that little by little you present the student something that they're able to produce and then a little bit more for them uh, to engage in a dialogue. So this is a summary of the pedagogies, the timeline and how it happened, what I just said. Um, you can go later and look at this and see where do you think that the context of your classroom and your teaching uh, falls. Uh, right now, uh, the ELL's practice and theories are mostly on the sociocultural um, and cognition practices. Um, <clears throat> so who are the second language learners? And, and right now I have been talking up to this point about second language learners, um, thinking that the ELLs are learning English as a second language or English as a new language. But we will see uh, throughout this, this talk that uh, the ELLs are not only um, learning English as a second language or as a new language. Some of them have been born in the United States and English has been always around their, their lives. Um, so the second language learners, um, in the case of the immigrant child, they already bring one language in the, into the classroom. So they can use whatever literacy they have, whatever knowledge they have in that language, they can um, bring it and use it in order to acquire this second language, English. And as teachers, we will be able to know the two systems, compare and help them to transfer positive um, information, meaning positive transfer where the two languages connect. Uh, going back to this universal grammar, the Chomsky talk, all the languages have certain principles that connect. And if we as teachers are able to connect um, the syntax of one language with the other, we can bring some, some prior knowledge into the new in learning English as a, as a new language. Um, the attitudes of the learner are very important. They vary depending on their age. Um, some of them want to learn. Uh, some of them uh, are rejecting. Uh, their experience in the United States. Um, as immigrant ch children, they, they feel that it's a lot of pressure to be able to communicate, to be able to socialize. Um, sometimes, um, depending on where they live uh, and the ideologies held by the community at large, um, they may feel that their language is not valued um, and and they reject their native language, but they still do not know English as the dominant language of the society. So these may act as filters um, that limit their acquisition of this second language because they have um, a negative attitude towards it. Um, informal versus formal settings. Um, and then that also, um, gives a different type of corrective feedback. So if, if they're in an informal setting, 
and the communication is flowing, maybe they don't receive corrective feedback, but they're in the, if they are in the classroom and you're teaching them formally the literacy of English academically, then they will receive constant corrective feedback. Uh, the young learners versus the older learners, they learn different. If you have ELLs that are in elementary school, they will be totally different than the students that are in, second, uh, in secondary uh, because the ones in secondary are more focused on, on this learning, on this knowledge. And, and then the socialization aspect goes when they're outside of the classroom. Uh, the exposure of the second language, um, what kind of discourse types they're exposed to, oral, written, um, if it's through songs, if it's through translations uh, or interaction through dialogue. Um, and if that second language is used in real communication. And this is key. For the ELLs, um, it is usually that case. They are trying to communicate and therefore their, their use of English, even if it's in the classroom, is more authentic that if um, that, for example, the, the students that I have in Spanish in my classroom, where they're not immersed in the society that speaks Spanish. Um, <clears throat> so the second language exposure is also adapt, is modify. So you may see that when you have your ELLs and you're teaching your content area, um, you may modify the words you use, the way you speak to the child or to the teenager. Uh, to be able to have this dialogue with, uh, with the child. Um, so you, your teaching changes into teacher talk, sometimes of teacher talk, and is not exactly authentic or the way they will find it in informal situations with native speakers of English. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I will go through this because I already talked about this, and this is the important part that we need to uh, be able to differentiate between our ELLs. So when we are not used to be in a in a environment with ELLs, and and we see that there is a new immigrant or there is a child that has a last name that is not so common and their parents do not speak the language very well, or you see that their parents are immigrants, um, schools tend to classify all of them as ELLs or ENLs, English as a new language. Um, and they group all of them in, in one room or in one type of resource that is offered, but they're different. And this is something that as teachers, we need to figure it out who are our ELLs? And there are basically two main types with some differences. There is the heritage language learners and there's the second language learner uh, and the second language is English. So the heritage language learners are those kids that are born in the US um, within households that speak another language. So for example, in my house, I have two children and my two children are heritage language learners. They were born in the US. They always watch English TV. They always went to supermarket and listened to English. So English was in their community, was always part of their lives. However, at home, they only spoke Spanish. So. Uh, when they were growing up, they didn't really make this difference. They, they didn't notice the difference until they went into school and um, they were totally immersed in English and they felt that they were different because at home they had a different practice. They had different kind of parents that were speaking a different language to them. So these are the heritage language learners. They usually know more English depending on the level of education of their parents, depending on the literacy acquisition of their parents, um, what the literacy level. Um, so those heritage language learner, learners are um, more advanced proficiency in proficiency in English, but there may not necessarily be uh, more literate in English. Um, and then the second language learners are those 
immigrant kids, the people who learn a different language. They grew up in, in a different system, a monolingual um, system of other language than English. And then at some point in their lives, they immigrate into the United States and they are learning English as a second language or English as a new language. These are um, some of the ELLs that, that you recognize right away, that you feel they need uh, immediate assistance to be able to communicate because the heritage speakers, they communicate already. Um, but they, they have different needs. So, um, so it is very important that we differentiate them. They cannot be taught in the same way. Um, the heritage are more proficient than the second language and the second language have an entire linguistic system that they can transfer and they can help to learn English. Whereas the heritage language, language learners do more code switching because they have two systems and they're born with two systems and grew up with the two systems um, at the same time. Okay, so, so far, um, does anyone has any comment about the ELLs that you have? Have you noticed this difference between the heritage language learners or the, the heritage speakers or the second language speakers? Anyone? Interestingly enough, in Riverhead, I feel like we have an even split of both of these language learners. Um, I teach special ed, so I actually have a lot more um, students who were born here in the country um, than the students moving here from another country, um, just because I guess they've had time to be classified, so they're usually the ones I'm exposed to, whereas my colleagues have more of like the students coming in from another country. So they're able to say, translate things into Spanish for those kids and have the kids um, you know, be literate enough to, to read the Spanish literature, whereas my kids, because of their disability, have trouble with that as well. Mm -hmm. um, just one of those interesting things I noticed. And, and you notice that the needs that each of these students have are totally different. Yeah, definitely. Like the, yeah. the kids coming in in seventh and eighth grade from another country, if they did have formal education, um, it's just a matter of like, you know, if they're having a hard time, you can just give them a Spanish version where um, mm -hmm. my special ed students have a hard time reading the Spanish in itself. So they might, and they might be able to communicate orally uh, better in English, but yet when it comes to the reading or the writing, they have a much harder time. Yes. And then the special ed um, is, is the, the needs that students will have if they're classified as an assessment children or special ed children um, are also different than, um, than language learning. So sometimes in some schools we confuse a student that is a heritage speaker, comes from a household where they speak Spanish and they are fluent in Spanish, but they're not literate, they don't, they're not surrounded by literacy in Spanish because their parents are not educated. Their parents not even completed elementary school. So this child doesn't have enough vocabulary. The child may have some social, uh, psychological conditions where, where insecurity, linguistic insecurity, um, the parents may not easily access um, the, the school setting and talking to the teachers. So sometimes these students are confused with a special ed kids. And then um, the pro their problem is not a learning difficulty. Their problem is literacy. Their problem is um, acquiring enough vocabulary and, and security to be able to communicate in the classroom. So all of these um, differences, we need to, to pay attention to that that ELL classification is so broad that we cannot just say all of them go to this classroom and all of them uh, are taught in the same way. Um, anyone else? So uh, let me continue talking a little bit about this difference between all the ELLs. So we know about the multiple intelligence. Uh, this is another 
uh, theory that is out there in our education field that we all learn differently. Um, under normal conditions, uh, some of us need uh, a little bit more input, uh, in different input in different ways. So the ELLs also learn differently and the literacy aspect and the linguistic aspect is very important uh, when we teach in all this kind of content. So um, there are some circumstantial factors that affect this uh, learning and is the type of intelligence, how we learn, um, what is our predisposition to learning, the aptitude. Sometimes we have talents for certain content, sometimes we don't. Um, and we have to learn anyway. So even if we're not good at math, we're learning math because it's part of the curriculum. Um, so the aptitude also is important, the personality. Uh, we generally believe that the timid kind of personality have a harder time learning. That might not be the case because maybe that timid child is able to learn more uh, introspectively, to think, uh, to reflect, to uh, do more writing, and this is a way they uh, obtain literacy. The extrovert uh, definitely is going to be able to risk more in the talking, uh, in, the prof in the oral proficiency, um, and that's the way they, they learn, but maybe they're not so careful about the writing part or the grammar part, so we need to help them balance that. Um, the anxiety that they come with into the classroom, what kind of anxiety do they have? How is this anxiety related to their family condition, to their community? Um, the motivation that they have and the attitudes, um, a lot of them, when they come into this country, they practically, they have an instrumental motivation. They need to be able to communicate. They need to be able to go to school. So that's more practical. Um, integrative is if in the case of the heritage speakers, if they want to maintain the language of their parents, why do they want to maintain it? Because they have a grandmother living at home with them and they need to communicate uh, because there's culture that they need to maintain that makes them feel secure about who they are. Um, the learner practice preferences, this is again through the um, going back to the multiple intelligences and the learner's beliefs. Sometimes um, there are certain languages that are devalued in our societies. Um, sometimes in certain contexts, people will give the child the message that if you speak Spanish, uh, you're poor or you're uneducated. And the child receives these ideas. And if they receive these ideas, that uh, affects the way they learn and affects the way they integrate into the English dominant uh, speaking society. The age of the acquisition, the environmental opportunities for real interaction. So definitely you learn a language better and, and faster if you are given the opportunities for that real interaction. Um, so uh, let me stop a little bit and talk uh, about the 1980s when I came into this country and I was an ELL. In the 1980s, uh, the belief still was that if a child um, was given two languages at the same time, that was detrimental for the child and you will confuse the child and that code switching was not good. Um, so that was the belief because in the 80s, only this studies of contact linguistics were coming um, to, to, to be uh, a topic. At that point, uh, people still very, teachers were very ignorant of what um, were the benefits of being bilingual. So when I came into the United States into sixth grade, um, I came into a school that had a lot of Colombian immigrants, but they didn't have a good program for me. And what, I, what they were doing with me was they were taking me out of the classroom and bringing me into a bilingual classroom with two teachers that spoke Spanish. And they were supposed to be teaching me English, but they were taking me out of the content areas and I was falling behind. And then the, te the way they were teaching me English was like a kindergartner. And I was already 11 years old. They, they were showing me flashcards of 
images and, and uh, making me repeat the vocabulary. So every time that they took me out, I was falling behind and behind in the content. I was not being um, level up or provided with the materials in my native language so I can keep up with my classmates. So they were learning and I was not. And nine months passed and I didn't learn English either because I was taken out of the immersion environment where I could listen to English. And I was brought into a classroom where people were talking to me in Spanish and teaching me through translation. This was in 1981. A lot of things have changed now. And some of you that are from these schools where you have uh, very structured programs in ELLs, um, you may see that it's different now. You have dual programs, uh, you have pull out and pull in programs, but if it's pull out is uh, as a support system, not to take the student out of what they need to learn. And if it's pull in, one of the ELLs experts come and, and help the child to navigate the content um, while learning English. So things have changed. Now teachers understand that bilingualism is not detrimental for the brain, that it's even better to be bilingual and that we need to support bilingualism. Um, and if our child, if our children in the classroom bring another language from home, we need to value that language so we can use it as a resource rather than um, telling the child or the parent, do not use it, do not speak it. We, we use whatever knowledge they have into learning English. So, so now things have changed. We are at another time. Um, and I don't imagine that, that the same kind of program exists anymore that, that I experienced. Um, when we talk about ELLs, we need to be able to talk about the sociolinguistic generation, not just the immigrant generation, but depending on the language they talk and how they are exposed to languages, what generation they are. So their generation one, if they immigrated after 12 years of age or more, because they already have a linguistic system and they bring a linguistic system from another place into the classroom and they can use that to learn English. Their generation 1.5, if they arrived as late immigrants between six and 12, because at that time, this, the child is still developing literacy in whatever native language they have. And now they are immersed in a second language or English. And now they need to learn literacy in both languages, depending on how the school supports them. And then there's generation two, when they are immigrants, when they, they were immigrants, they were, they were babies. They came into the United States before acquiring uh, before the school, before acquiring literacy in that native language. So they only become proficient in their native language, the language of the parents orally. They don't really learn how to read and write in that language. And then they talk their proficiency, uh, they're proficient in that native language, but then they go into this school um, where English is used and then they learn literacy in English. And soon after, this kind of generations, the generation two forget the um, native language if they don't have enough input. And then there's the generation three where the grandparents are the ones that are the immigrants, not the parents. In generation two are the parents, in generation three are the grandparents. By that time, a lot of immigrant kids have immersed themselves into English because their parents are fluent in English and they lose their native language. They only have a passive knowledge of the language. Some of them retain it because the grandparents live with them and there is a language that is important in the household. So this is important to recognize in your ELLs, what sociolinguistic generation they belong to. Any questions so far or comments? <clears throat> um, another um, a aspect that, that we need to pay attention is the bilingual proficiency of our students, the ELLs. Um, what, where are they from? And what kind of dialect do they bring from their families? This um, really adds to their identity 
and how they present themselves in the classroom. Uh, and the ideal, the linguistic ideologies behind this may tell them that if they are from Caribbean regions, oh, maybe I speak a bad Spanish, uh, talking about Spanish. And that creates them some insecurity in what they bring into the classroom and what they can use um, in order to learn English. Um, the way they talk, the way they relate to others. Um, how do they use both languages in daily life? Where is English spoken to them? Where is Spanish or where is Chinese or where is um, any other immigrant language uh, is spoken? Is it only at the home? Is English allowed in the home? So it's a bilingual home or it's a monolingual uh, exclusive home and the parents are very strict about the use of that language at home. The age of the acquisition, the exposure to either language also um, takes, um, it is something that we need to take in consideration. So talking about age, um, the heritage speakers are usually bilingual first language acquisition. So they not only acquire one language as a first language, but they acquire two. So my kids are an example of this. I always allowed English in the home, but I had enough Spanish input. So they were bilingual since the very beginning. And when they arrive at a school, because I live in a community that is mostly English speaking, then they started, uh, they stopped using Spanish orally, they understood. So now their Spanish is more passive, understanding only. Um, but in their um, acquisition of English, uh, you can see that uh, at some point now that they're in high school, middle school, their vocabulary is different, uh, the vocabulary that they use in English, because they transfer some of the Spanish words that come from Latin and English words that also are in contact, were in contact with Latin in history. And now they have all this increased vocabulary that a monolingual English kid may not have because they don't have a contact with Spanish. Um, so it depends on the input. Um, <clears throat> the proficiency may change through life. Uh, as my kids, they became more proficient in English than in Spanish later on in life. The function of each language. Uh, when they talk about food or family, they may switch to Spanish, but when, when they talk about academics, they may do it in English, depending on the input they receive. Uh, in the speech community, if it's urban and monolingual, basically, or if it's urban and, and more diverse and multilingual, um, the passive and respect and receptive knowledge versus the active um, uh, knowledge of the of the language. When the student, the heritage speaker or the ELL that you have in your classroom has early acquisition of a second language, these are the ones that um, started um, with uh, the English input very early when they were little. Um, so these are basically the heritage speakers that you have in the class. They're very proficient orally, but in writing, they may not be as proficient as uh, the older students. And then you have the late acquisition, which are the second language learners that started um, with the input and the exposure to English when they enter school, when they were four, and, and they went through all elementary school until they were 12 um, with this input of English in this school. Um, <clears throat> There is, in this, all these theories about second language acquisition, there's a critical language learning period. And this happens between the ages of nine and 12. So those of you that teach at middle school, um, it is more complicated to teach in the middle school these this ELLs because at that point in puberty, uh, there's a language fixation uh, where um, whatever language is stronger, whatever language they receive in, a stronger input is fixing um, certain structures, grammatical structures, certain vocabulary. So then for the child, and then there's also all this social anxiety around this age that will really make the student become, um, produce more filters to learn that English 
language learning, the identity construction, how they see themselves within the community. All of this becomes very complex between the nine and the 12 years of age. If they're early arrivals and they have been exposed to English since they were babies, before they enter school, this time may be easier for them. But if they were late arrivals and they came when they were seven, eight, uh, and they haven't really acquired English when they reach this period, the critical language um, period, then it will be, there will be some filters and some difficulty at that time the teachers need to address. Um, the input is very important. Not only the input from a school and from the teachers, but what is happening at home. Um, do they live with grandparents? What is the input of grandparents? What level of education is there at the home? Uh, grandparents, parents, are they educated uh, through higher education? They only finish secondary, elementary. That's very important to get to know what is the um, the possibilities of this child to transfer knowledge from one language into the other and become literate in English. Um, do they have extended family contact? Do they go back and forth to the country of origin? Um, what kind of input they have from, from this extended family in general and what kind of identity they they create dual identity by having contact with the extended family. Um, so, and then analyzing if the two languages, when um, Spanish or, or the other language, I'm talking Spanish because that's my background, but when does it become reduced? When the student starts getting more and more English and less Spanish and how that is affecting the identity construction of this child, because learning a language is not only about learning the linguistic system, but also um, identifying with the culture of that language that, that the child is, is accessing, is learning. Um, the speech communities. Um, do the speech communities see them as a different kind of person? Um, do they feel that if they speak Spanish in a mostly English community, they will be rejected or not accepted or their parents are discriminated. All of this affects the child. If they live in more urban areas where there's more immigrants and multilingual communities, maybe this will be more common for the child and the attitude that the child has in the classroom to learn English will be more open um, to immerse themselves into, into the community. So it occurs differently in urban, suburban, rural settings. And uh, all of you come from different kinds of settings. So this, this may present to you a, a difference in how you address um, your content and each ELL in your classrooms. The order of birth is also an, an aspect that, um, that needs to be considered. Uh, usually uh, scholars in bilingualism say that the older child is more proficient in the language of their parents because their parents spoke to this child um, mostly in their native language. But then when the second child is born, the first child already knows English and brings English into the home. <coughs> so the, the younger child is going to speak more um, uh, more English than, than the native language of their parents. Uh, but this varies, <coughs> sorry. And I have found that um, some of my heritage speakers in the classroom, my Spanish heritage speakers that are younger, sometimes they speak more um, Spanish than, than older kids. And this depends on their personality too, depends on their input, the, depends on their connections with parents and, and other family members. So it all depends on the input. Um, although by in general terms, the older child usually is more dominant than the younger child. Um, so the monolingual stages of language development um, in, in Spanish, and this is my background, uh, usually in the early acquisition, uh, the child is, will learn similarly under normal circumstances, 
The cognitive development occurs the same way for all the children if uh, their cognitive development is normal. So they will learn verbal agreement first, then the verbal aspect, when to use the predicate, the imperfect. Predate imperfect is the simple past versus the used to, um, the, uh, the past perfect past, uh, and then the subjunctive mode. Um, for the bilingual speaker, um, this may change uh, because of the input, as I has been saying it. If it's unbalanced, if they receive more input um, in different kind of uh, vocabularies and different kind of contexts in one language or the other. And then if they start a school early and, and then the input is majority in English and they have an incomplete acquisition of the Spanish and that knowledge they can then transfer it into their English learning. Um, <clears throat> the child may have received complex grammatical structures in their native language, but as soon as they get to school and start getting that uh, those structures in English and focus on literacy in English, then those grammatical structures start to be to erode, to, to, they start to lose them and then uh, the child loses the bilingualism and then becomes um, proficient in English, but not taking the advantage of their bilingualism. Um, early exposure plus sustained input uh, means home language maintenance. Why home language maintenance is important for ELLs? Because it will um, increase their security, their linguistic security, who they are. They will understand their dual identities and feel and have a better attitude towards uh, who they are in this country. Um, they still recognize that they come from immigrant communities, but that they are also um, from the United States and they're also immersed in this, in this country. They validate their experiences of their parents and, and they feel important in that way. So, so that language maintenance of the home is important and also because they can transfer um, knowledge uh, from that culture and from that linguistic system into um, the English language. Um, Sorry, I'm gonna interrupt you for one quick moment here. Um, mm -hmm. We are running long. Um, we will uh, up the amount of time to uh, 1.5 uh, CTLE hours for those of you who can stay on. Okay. Need to get off because of the time constraints. So feel free to do that. I'm just going to mark that you've got it. Um, in okay. it I am putting in the uh, form for evaluation, and I'm going to turn it back over to you, Maria. Okay, and I'm almost done with this. I think I I'm repeating myself a lot about this, and you will have this uh, information. Um, it is very important that when you have the ELLs, you analyze their domains. So. What are their domains? What language is spoken at home? Uh, their parents work. What is their language? What kind of work their parents do? If they have um, uh, practices, church, they go to church, what kind of um, religious activities they have. Usually the religious activities are, are very important for that language acquisition or that language maintenance. So analyzing domains is very important. And what type of bilinguals do you have in your classroom? Do you have the coordinates uh, where the languages are independent? Uh, Spanish at home, English at a school. Do you have the compound where the two languages are learned uh, within the same context? Uh, or do you have the sub coordinate where um, they have a weaker language and a stronger language? And they interpret the words of, of this of the weaker language uh, through the stronger language. Um, <clears throat> and the bilingual behavior, and you'll you see this in ELLs, um, brings a lot of code switching, uh, pragmatic semantic meaning relations. So they start to make sense by putting languages together. A lot of times, as teachers, we we said, well, is if they code, they're not really using the language. No, code switching is healthy um, if um, we analyze exactly what is happening. Uh, so for example, these are some um, statements from my own children where 
They um, pluralize adjectives in English because we do that pluralization in Spanish. So if you understand what the difference is between the two linguistic systems, you're able to address it and you're able to, um, to give corrected feedback to the student and they know that it's not that they're doing it wrong, but that they're bringing something, uh, a negative transfer from one language into the other because they don't agree on, on those kind of a structures. So for example, here we have a, an example where he says, ¿A dónde llegamos? So where are we? And then my son said, the story house. And uh, he's trying to say the library. And I said, but how do you say the story house in, in Spanish? And, and then he thinks he's talking in Spanish by saying, how's the stories? And basically what he's doing is changing the syntax, but not the vocabulary. So this is something that your elementary ELLs would do um, in this interaction between two languages. And here's where you need to be aware of the feedback that you provide to the child. So here we, um, I have some tables where um, uh, there's some description of what kind of programs are there in ESL or ENL. And then here is the table where you have all kinds of programs that uh, target maintenance, uh, two-way immersion, bilingual immersion, and how is it done. In your school districts, depending on the resources you have, if you have experts, if you have the immigrant population to teach, you may adapt different kinds of resources. Uh, these are two uh, scholars in the field, Anacelia Centella and Kim Potoski, and I added some YouTube videos there for you to look uh, to watch later. Kim Potoski in particular talks about this ELL programs um, and uh, how um, they are important for language, native language maintenance and encouraging uh, the teaching uh, and the learning of English. And there are some resources. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing <clears throat> and uh, see if anyone has comments, you want to talk about your own ELLs uh, so we can wrap up this information. Anything that you were thinking while I was talking about the theories, about the practices, this is an introduction to second language acquisition. Any story that happened at your classroom with your ELLs? Any difficulty or any success? So with my new student, she is primarily Spanish speaking. Um, and I know like this much Spanish from high school. Um, and so I try to, to use a little bit of that as well. And like, if I'm giving directions, um, I'll give directions in Spanish so that she knows what's expected of her. Even if it's like, I run it like through translate to at least give her an idea. So she knows what's expected from her. Um, but if I say it wrong, she's so good. Like if I say something wrong or like totally out there, she'll look at me and be like, no, <laughs> like try again. <laughs> so she's giving you corrected feedback. Yes. Um, and she, you know, I mean, it's definitely, this is my first experience with an ELL. Um, and it's definitely been, um, you know, a challenge. It's definitely kind of changed the way I look at, at how I go about teaching. Um, but I just always think it's funny when I say something and she's like, mm -mm, no, <laughs> like that's not right. And do you find yourself modifying your teacher talk when you talk to her and compare it to other students? A little bit um, more in just trying to speak more slowly and use like more gestures um, and even just consciously trying to use fewer words. Those, so she's getting the meaning without all the clutter. Um, but, you know, I try she's she is super, super, I think, like educated in her native language. She's very literate in Spanish. Um, so it's you know, I want to give her opportunities to use that, but I also want her to feel like she knows what's going on around her. Um, so it's kind of like striking that balance has been uh, yeah. an interesting navigation. Yeah, you will see that uh, very soon. And also because she's in a community that is mostly English monolingual, very mm -hmm. 
Japan, she will start talking in English and you don't even notice uh, when that happened. Uh, yeah. It, it has, and they go through a, through a silent period also. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, all this comes out of their mouths and they start, <laughs> they, they show proficiency. And, and uh, so all this input is processed um, mm -hmm. point, but they don't really express it until they're ready. Right. Yeah. And I, I know she's definitely still in that silent period, but um, I think once she, once she starts going, she's definitely seems like the type that she's just going to take it and run. So mm -hmm. I'm excited. I'm excited to see how it all pans out. Yeah. Security that, is very important. Yes. I think that it's very interesting that um, students who are at the stage uh, where they had a little of each, their emotional what was going on really affected which language was used. If someone got very upset, they'd revert back to their native tongue. Uh, and sometimes if they were talking, let's say to a, you know, it was a little girl talking to a little boy she liked, she might, you know, speak back in Spanish rather than English. So the level of emotion was often related to which language, especially if someone got angry, you know, they could be mm -hmm. talking English or reading something, and all of a sudden the upset portion would come out in the native tongue. So I was found that interesting. Yeah, definitely. Learning language had is very close related to your feelings, to how you express it, because it's communicative. You're communicating, um, uh, you're trying to get a message across and you're communicating who you are. So so the the security that they have in that um, development uh, is, is very important <clears throat> of the language. And that's what we need to pay attention to as teachers. Anything else? Oh, Sandra has her hand up. Sandra, is your hand up? Oh no, I don't think I don't think it is. It shouldn't be. I don't know how it got up. No, it's my cursor. It's my cursor. I'm sorry. Um, anybody else would like to say something? Okay, and um, there there is uh, there are different programs that will um, prepare you to be with the ELLs, and and this is something that the New York State is really pushing for, uh, because uh, a lot of the school districts are lacking of these um, teachers that are able to work, and you're trying to figure it out, and um, and if you are in a multilingual kind of urban setting, maybe you can figure it out easily because you have more support systems. But if you are in a town like Oneonta, where where you don't have that many, then it's, it's difficult. Um, Marketville, I think it uh, has a lot of immigrants from a particular place. And we get some of these students in our college. Um, and I have several students from this, from, from this town in the past. Um, I edited a book with all of my Spanish heritage speakers. Um, Mi vida en los Estados Unidos is in Spanish. And if you can read Spanish, um, it tells all their stories. It's, it's important for you as teachers to know um, the struggles, where they come from, how is that their parents arrived in the United States? Why? What was the need? Um, and what is their sit their family situation to be able to connect with them? Connection is very important to be able to teach them English and, and allow them to be um, communicative proficient in English and be successful. Okay, any more questions or comments? So next, in February, my colleague Alejandra Escudero will talk about linguistic systems um, of different languages. Uh, so she will uh, touch on the topic of the grammars, how all these languages connect and how it's important for ELL teachers to know um, how, you don't need to be proficient in, a, in another language, but you need to know how the languages work to be able to understand what is that your student is trying to 
to put together in English. When you see that English is weird, it's twisted, that whatever output they have is kind of different, is because it's interfered by their native language. And it's important for you to recognize that and to be able to give corrected feedback um, comparing the linguistic systems. So she will talk about that. And that is one of the courses in her program of uh, linguistics for, for um, teachers. And, um, and is another aspect of, of being or becoming um, a bilingual teacher. Thank you. Erin, anything else? Thank you, Maria. Um, so I put in the chat uh, links to one, the evaluation form, if you would complete that, please, and then put in there that it's the ELL session one. Um, you do have link in there, the pre today's presentation, but I will also send that out to you uh, in the next couple of days, as well as it is on our website. And then um, there is a link for you to register for the next program, which will be our February 3rd. And just like this one, if it does run a little bit long, we can offer a little bit of an extension on the amount of time. So we'll give you 1.5 for ELL today. Thanks everyone for coming. This is great. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Best idea.